that these particular kind of viruses that he alone on earth was the master of caused cancer. It was a certain class of retrovirus called the C class retrovirus. That was Bob had shown two little islands off of, off of Japan, little teeny islands south of Japan. There was a particular kind of disease there. It was cancer kind of thing. And there also was this virus there that he hadn't found anywhere else. He hadn't looked anywhere else either. You know, and that didn't bother Bob. He announced that he had found the cause of one kind of cancer, which was supposed to help him get another $500,000 grant from the federal government the next year because he had published something finally of all these people that were at the National Cancer Institute trying to show that viruses could cause cancer. He was the only one that had shown it. And the reason he was the only one is because he didn't believe in the scientific method. He didn't even think about the fact that you can't pin causality just on the fact that the two were there together. I didn't cause you. We're here together. What about all these other people, I could say? Maybe he caused me. Maybe all of you caused me. I don't know. But if I say, she caused me because we're here together, everybody would say, fuck that. Well, the National Cancer Institute did not say fuck that. They said, here's another 500 grand from the people's pocketbook. Go ahead and do it some more. But Bob suddenly got a message from his friend Margaret Heckler, who was the Health, Education, Welfare Secretary, friend of Ronald Reagan, who was tired of seeing homosexuals picketing in front of the goddamn White House. He says, every time I come to work, I start wondering if I'm one too. <laughs> Get him out of here. Margaret, don't we have some kind of building down there in Bethesda where they do science? <laughs> yes, we do, Mr. President. Well, you tell them to fix it. <laughs> so she did, and she went down there, and she talked to Bob, and he said, I got, the, I got it right here, and I also have these cool wraparound sunglasses. Let's have a press conference. <laughs> so... There you got Bobby, and I, I think Alan Alda didn't, I think Nicolas Cage is better Bob Gallo, you know. <laughs> Gentlemen, we found the probable cause of AIDS. Applause, applause, applause. And uh, America, by the way, found it just a little bit before the French. Uh, as it actually turned out, because it takes a boat about eight months to get from France to America, we hadn't heard yet that the French had actually found the virus sometime before. And Gallo announced it as though he had found it. Turns out he's stolen it from Luc Montagnier at the Pasteur Institute, and that's now been straightened out, and Gallo doesn't get any money for it anymore, although he got a lot of money for it at first. You know, so we've already figured out. Our own government has told us Gallo is a crook. He is a thief and a crook, a liar. And also they're saying, don't kiss deeply, because you might exchange Gallo's imaginary virus, which we believe in even though Gallo is almost dead. And he's been told, everybody, knows, everybody knew that Bob, Bob was a lying bastard. Everybody who ever went to one of his meetings knew he was greedy, ambitious, and just the kind of person who might step down into some kind of crap like he did. You know, and, and he's already, you know, pretty much disgraced, except for the fact that he's got a lot of money from our government. But the government it, it itself said, you can't have any more money from that, Bob, because actually it belongs to the French. You know you stole it from them. That, that happened, that, I mean, that was a court case that was not too long ago. Bob Gallo has been discredited. He stole it. He stole it, but he flushed it off on us, and we didn't think, well, it was stolen goods, man, and so we don't want it. We want to ruin our lives with his stupid concepts that don't, they don't even really, they're not reasonable to call them concepts. I mean, if that virus caused anything, it causes a real simple word to understand. It means without that virus, you can't have this. That causes this, right? Well, that's a perfect situation for science to deal with. Well, let's just see if we can take that virus and nothing else and cause it. Okay, well, we could infect everybody in America and count up the bodies. But that would be a very, you know, not an economical experiment. So, but we can look back at what happens when people get it. You know, and, and looking back, it's fine. So it doesn't have any big effects. There's no way that you can write up a report that says this study right here showed conclusively or even probably that HIV was the cause of this thing which is so complicated it's hard to call it by anything more than a three-letter word, AIDS. Is that four? I guess it's four. It's like it's, it's the dumbest goddamn thing. I can't believe that you people are so stupid, you know? When I came down here 
I said, I'm not going to Earth again. Those people hadn't got any brains, you know? But I was sleepy because I'd been taking drugs. No, I mean, how can, you, how can this planet have that kind of mentality? Because we are the same people, I think, you know, that, that like, uh, well, what did we do, cool? Let's see. We have good movies. We do make good movies sometimes. And we have a medical system that's a huge dragon. You know, I, being a part of it, don't ever go to it. <laughs> I don't care whether I have medical insurance or not because I don't ever partake. I like drugs, but I don't like doctors. I don't like the whole system. I think there's something very scary about people wearing white things like that, you know. It sort of reminds me of church. And I think scientists and church is something you ought to think about because they've gotten to be sort of the same. I mean, the Catholics pulled out sort of and the scientists have moved in. And, and the AIDS thing, and this is what I think, we're here in the nice summer air. Let's don't talk about disease. I mean, this, nobody, there's not something called AIDS. There's a lot of people with a lot of different diseases that have all been hoaxed into thinking that they've got this one terrible fatal thing. And, and Christine sure has it, you know. And she's going to pass it on to the rest of us. And, and we all do have that one. But we don't have this other stuff, whatever. We, some of us have bad cough. Some of us have got funguses growing all over us. Some of us, I had some funguses growing on me. If I'd have been HIV positive, but I had to turn myself in. So I've got AIDS because I've got things between my toes. Then I got some Sporinox and it cleared it up. And so I don't have AIDS. I may have HIV. I never checked. Now, I wouldn't either. You know, I wouldn't either. I wouldn't really try to figure out if I'd ever been a member of the Communist Party either in the 50s. I would have said, I don't think I was. And uh, I'm certainly not going to want you checking it right now because I'm applying for a job. It's the same kind of thing. It's a, it's a terribly perjurative kind of a thing. And it, it is, and like people talked about how the test doesn't work and all that stuff. But you know, all the details about whether things work and whether it all fits together, whether hemophiliacs really have AIDS or whether they just have an immune suppression thing, whether Africa is still afloat when it should be all dead people stacking up the last, the last of them there should be stacking up the corpses of the rest of them. Haiti should have been totally wiped out. All of us, there should be 20 million of us with AIDS by now. See, all the predictions turned out not to be true, didn't they? They still have the old beasts. They also still have in California, I think, a, an association, a bunch of goddamn bureaucrats worried about the drought, worrying about whether my shower is going to run or not, how fast, and all what I can get two and a half gallons. We've got those guys at the same time as we get federal money for floods. And I didn't, last time I checked the reservoirs down in San Diego, they were pretty full. But I still can't take a shower legally. You have to drill the little thing out. They put something in there, right? That's the government puts it in there to protect us from being thirsty in the year 2070. But it's part of government. They've also told you. <laughs> See, they, they don't really have a reason for being, do they? <laughs> what do they do? Make up one. Think of something to scare people, same as scientists. They don't have a reason for being. You don't need them. I mean, you need some technician type people, you need some engineers to make better stuff to work with, to play with, but you don't really need somebody telling you about the deep mysteries of the universe, unless maybe Carl Sagan wants a week. But like, you don't really need us. But you worry that maybe if you don't have us, used to at least, the Russians might get there first or something like that. And they're gone. So then what are we gonna have to deal with? Nature. The big threat is that we're destroying the planet and you need the scientists now to tell you why and how you can stop it. And, and the plague is such a great little thing to pull. I mean, polio had warned then, admit it. The CDC, nobody even knew what the hell the CDC was in 1975. And by 1980, their budget was definitely under review. And the head of the CDC says, CDC says, we, and he, there's, a, there's a, a memo intercepted by the Freedom of Information Act, and this guy says, we need a plague. A plague is what the CDC needed, and that's what they got. And, there's, and now they're already warming up the next one. They're talking about Ebola virus like it was something brand new that had happened because of the ecological crisis in Africa, and it was going to get us. And we have to be ready to mobilize the CDC, put their uniforms on. You know those guys have uniforms? They have uniforms. They don't wear them, but they have uniforms. In fact, when that critter with the funny beard 
was was the head of a of the he's a, like our, our big doctor the big doctor in Washington. He Coop, yeah. He said we're gonna have to wear the uniforms at least once a week because keep people reminded that we're an army. Those guys are crazy. I mean, they are. They they really are crazy, and the the things that they dream up are stranger than things that we would make that would make good movies. They're just. You know, this virus is mad because we've encroached on its habitat, so now it's going to come out and get us? Well, they don't have legs, viruses, don't have legs or wings or any kind of way to move, and they don't give a shit about us. And they don't crap, care about their environment. They never heard of that. And they're just sitting there in some place, and they've always been there, and they always probably will lurking around, but they're not after us. And we're not making a mess out of this earth either. We aren't. We're an arrogant little bunch of naked apes. That's all we are. And we're crowing about this horrible disease that's decimating our planet and paying all these people fortunes and taking poisonous things. I mean, we're dumb. Why would the viruses care about us? I mean, <laughs> I mean maybe they care about the whales. I bet you if there's any problem on the planet now, it's the ants. Okay, because, I mean, and I'm straying a, a field here, but I'm, I'm telling you, we're not just talking about the details of the HIV positive test or this pretty little invention of mine that fixed me up good. I mean, if you don't like it, it certainly set me up. I mean, <laughs> I didn't do it. I had no idea about AIDS at that point. I was thinking about other things, but it, it did fit right into there, and I, I liked having done it, but it, it's like everybody else has got to have their own kind of thing like that. Tell us how you found out how you... You, how found out what? The blood, the blood the work you were doing for the L.A. Blood Bank. You mean how I discovered that there was no evidence that there was HIV? Yeah. That, that HIV caused AIDS? Okay, I, my, this is my personal story, but I mean, the, the, the general fact is there isn't any, and you can check it yourself. You can go to the Internet, and you can say, AIDS, cause, return. Go on Alta Vista or something like that, bang, you'll get papers. The first 20 hits you get, out of those, there will probably be about six or seven that suggest that there is no evidence, okay? There will be not a single one that suggests that there is evidence for a causal relation between those two things. Now, when I was working down the street here, it was down that way, down toward Michigan Street, a place called Specialty Labs, I was working for this, those guys three or four days a month, and I was setting up tests to look for viruses like HIV in the blood supply for LA. And since there were so many people in LA, there was going to be a, it was a pretty hard, to see how are you going to test all the, all the that's about 1,000 bottles every day. So we had put a lot of effort into it, and it'd be, we'd been successful, and I was having to write that up for the people who had paid for it, which is your representative government. And I was writing this little paragraph, and I said, well, I've got to explain why we were doing it in the first place. So I said, well, HIV is the probable cause of AIDS. That was my first sentence, because I thought it was, because that's what I'd heard. And I hadn't questioned it. I just heard it. I said, well, if all these people think that's true, there's probably evidence back there somewhere that suggests it. And so I asked somebody, what, what reference, what little work of scientific reporting should I quote so that somebody inter interested in finding out why I thought that could find out himself? The guy said, well, the guy that I asked was the wrong person to ask. He said, you don't have to quote that. And you don't have to say anything. Everybody knows it. I said, well, I don't know why I know it. I just know that I heard it. And in a scientific thing, it's a lot different from a movie where all you have to do is have a character say something you want to have as a fact. In a scientific publication, you are required, you know, by the system, not by the editors of the journals because they let you get away with a lot of crap sometimes, but you're required by the elements, the scientific things that have made it work to always tell the person that you're now telling something new to where you started from. You say, I, starting here, have worked to there. So we moved one small step. But if the place I started wasn't, if I don't even tell you what that is, you don't know we've moved anywhere, and you can't trust that. I have to tell you where I started from. Well, in that case, I couldn't find it. I, I started asking people. I started getting real sort of uneasy about it after about a year, because I still hadn't written the damn thing, and it was due about a month from when I started it. So it was real late, because I couldn't finish it. But I started asking people all over the world because I started traveling all about that time because everybody studying AIDS wanted to use PCR. That was my invention. So I got invited to all these meetings and I'd tell them how to do PCR. Well, I didn't care that much about AIDS to begin with, but I started caring after I realized none of these people, when asked directly, 
privately, sweetly, you know, could come up with anything to help me out. And all I wanted to have was one scientific paper to quote that I could say, this is where I got the concept from that HIV is the probable cause of AIDS. And I thought at that point that that's pretty damn significant because there was a tremendous amount of interest. There were meetings, 10,000 people gather in Amsterdam, you know, 10,000 people gather in, in, in various cities around the world every year or two to talk about this work they've been doing at our expense to cure this disease, which they've created at our expense, really. And not a single one of them can find a quote that I could use in a simple little paper to the NIH, that's the National Institutes of Health, that said, the reason you guys sent us 50,000 bucks for this project is because HIV is the probable cause of AIDS and it would be a good idea to see if it's in the blood supply. Right? There's no way to support that statement. No reason to do that work. It was all a waste of time, except that I enjoyed it. I love to drive from San Diego to LA twice a month. <laughs> it was, I, I made a living. And if you think about that, that's where all those guys are making a living. But I changed the question after a while because I was getting no luck with what should I quote, you know. I finally said, when was it that you came to the conclusion? Because you must be, because you just gave a talk about AIDS and HIV. When did you come to the conclusion that HIV was the probable cause of AIDS? Personally, when did you come to the conclusion? And they would generally allude to some paper or something that they had read or whatever, but no one has ever been able to explain to me anything else than I heard it in the New York Times or on TV. Uh, was that fiction or was that fact on TV? It didn't bother anybody to even think about it. I don't know how it is that we all overlook real obvious things like that, but you know, we've done it before on this planet. We do it regularly. It's expected of us to be idiots. I, I've got a new disease to attend to. I need a drink. <laughs> and <laughs> okay, let's remember this. It, it, AIDS is in fact, I mean, and if you look at all this stuff together, and you've, if you've ever taken a philosophy course, like an introductory, when I took a bunch of them because they had girls in them, and that my chemistry courses at Berkeley didn't. So I strayed over to the philosophy department a lot. And, and I thought, this is the most useless information I've ever, you know, but there are some nice reasons to be here. So lately I have started realizing that this is really, a, this whole thing, it brings out, and fr from like Christine's story, you know, to Paul's, like, I'd say, he's kind of young still. The Georgia Tech boys, we're not, you know, I'm one too. But I've aged, you know, and matured. And so I don't jump on him. I'm a libertarian, you know, by nature, but I've become more and more so as I've realized how little I really know about things, you know. And it is not a good idea, I think, to try to find another cause for AIDS before we have found out whether or not the one that the world believes is true and which has caused them so much disaster. See, the, the cause of AIDS, supposed the HIV, has caused a lot more trouble in the world than AIDS itself. So the thing to do is to, don't worry about AIDS right now. It'll go away, by God, it is going away, and it will continue to go away unless the government raises the ante. You know, they're paying $2,500 a year to every county for every AIDS patient. So there's a good there's a reason to have AIDS in my county if I'm the health guy, because it's my budget. Like if you think about how many AIDS cases they can claim to have in LA, multiply that by $2,500, and think about how many cars and stuff you can buy with that, you can see why there's an impetus for like saying, if there's anybody that looks anything like an AIDS case, call it AIDS. And don't you listen to Kerry Mullis. He's against the state and humanity and your daughter. <laughs> well, that's, but AIDS is going away nonetheless, and if we stop funding it, it would vanish overnight. HIV, however, is something we can detect and people can make money for detecting it. And as long as when they detect it in someone, that person is pretty much cast into an incredibly bad place in which they will be injected with or coerced to take hideous drugs. Their children will be taken away from them if they won't do it to them. I mean, that's the side of it that we need to worry about. It doesn't make a damn what causes AIDS, really. 
But the question that we should be asking is, why have we decided that having HIV makes you our favorite Jew, nigger, smoker, whatever we want to jump on, right? You're the perfect one because you brought it on yourself while your lascivious behavior. Something like that. See, we need something like that because, by God, they took away all of our other things like that, didn't they? Those goddamn Democrats. <laughs> you know, you can't call people names anymore, except you can say they're HIV positive, and you can tell your kids, if you don't eat your cereal, you'll grow up to be HIV positive, and all that stuff. I mean, we're using, that's the thing I think we ought to think about here, not whether or not AIDS is caused by it or not. But even if it were caused by it, how do we deal with something like that when maybe it's causal for the very few people that actually get it? See, the people that get AIDS are a very small group compared to the people that have HIV. It may be causal for those people that get it, but it may be that the rest of them just don't have the right chemistry to get, HIV, get AIDS when they get HIV. That's a possibility, which means that, HIV, that AIDS is kind of a genetic heritage that makes you susceptible to some virus that most people can tolerate quite well. That's an alternate hypothesis. Given that that's true, is it fair to stigmatize all of the 99% of people that have HIV but don't have AIDS with the concept that they are going to die and you better give them some lethal drugs to hasten the process and get them out of the place? I mean, is that all right? I don't know. Maybe if you're homosexual, you should just be killed right away, too, because, you know, you might have it, right? You might have it. We've got to check you for it right away. Yeah? Yeah? They didn't do that to you, did they? Or you just lascivious. <laughs> so am I. I hadn't had one because I don't go to them. You know, you shouldn't go to those people. You know, you go to witch doctors, they're going to put a hex on you. And if you can prove in your mind that our doctors aren't witch doctors, then look at the definition of witch doctors and see if it doesn't fit. I mean, if you want to go to those people, go ahead, but don't expect them to treat you well. You know, why would you think that they're going to treat you well? That's a neurotic claim. We all know that lawyers don't treat you well, don't we? Do you come up? My lawyer is so bad, he sends me a bill. You know? He sends me more. I mean, he tries to take me for a ride. We know that about them. We know that about ourselves. Don't lay yourself at the feet of somebody just because he puts on a white robe and makes statements in Latin. It's, it's not, it, that's not a good, that, it's not that medicine doesn't have some good things going for it. They've got drugs, that's for one thing. Sometimes those are useful, but they're not made by those guys. Those guys don't even know how to write the structure of those drugs. Those are made by chemists. You know, we don't go to chemists to find out whether we should pee at the right places or have sex in this way or that, you know. Chemists don't know either. The doctors certainly don't know. I mean, we are living in a pretty weird planet here, but, the, but it shouldn't be that weird. It really shouldn't. You go to some one profession to get the products from another profession. And, and the one profession tells you all about all that stuff about them. They don't know anything about them. The other one doesn't sell them to you. They sell them to those. You know? I mean, it's like, it's a funny kind of a thing going on there. A chemist who makes AZT himself can't go out and buy some to take. Same thing with any other drug. The chemists are making them. The chemists don't get to prescribe them. Why don't the doctors make them? Because they don't have the sense. They don't know how to do it. The doctors don't know how to make drugs. They buy them. And if they've got anything else, I'd like to see it. You know, what has changed? What is the difference between our medical people and which doctors? It's drugs. Now, they don't make them. They have an economic way of like being the only people that can give them to you and they make money out of doing that and they act so cool, you know? That they really are a worthless bunch of bastards if you're sick. Okay, you want me to stop talking like that? Oh, okay, what do you want to know? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just want to say, uh, yeah, at this point, since it, it's getting long in the day, you guys have gotten an idea. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to open any dialogue, Please do so. Please um, know that this is an open forum. That if you have any proof that HIV does cause AIDS, please show it to me as soon as possible, or anyone else here. But uh, other than that, this is a safety net. This is a, this is something I'm putting out because I believe that if you tell enough people, enough people will care. Enough people are good, true, and beautiful human beings. Um, to be honest with you, I'm, I am disappointed that not, not more of my own colleagues, actor friends that I had invited that said, I'll be there, are not here. 
but one is actually David Gray. Thank you very much. And uh, Krista Rowe. I mean, there's a bunch of you people, Apollonia, but there should be more. There should be a lot more. We should care about this because we dish this out unthinkingly to the world. And I think it is our responsibility, first and foremost, to finally go through this educational process, as uncomfortable as it is, because it's worth it. Because if what we are saying or suggesting is true, the implications are humongous. They're terrible. Then we are living in the belly of the beast, and what do we do about that? I don't want to take it sitting down. So if any of these meetings brings back one or two people, it would have been worthwhile for me to put them together because one or two people is exactly uh, what we literally got the last time we held one of these, and one of those people is Laura Shapiro. And I thank God we put on the event because without Laura's help, so much necessary work would not be done because Christine is pregnant and Christine and Robin and the people at Heal only have so much. We did not choose to ask you for money, nor is this a press event because we think that the integrity of this information stands on its, on its own. And at some point, you will be compelled to join forces in whatever way you can. At some point, you will be compelled to talk to your rich friends about this, to talk to your celebrity friends, to tell people, you know, just, just hear some of this stuff out. Just read this information. Just see for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, any questions, any thoughts, anybody want to share their experiences or anybody have a problem with what was discussed here today? Yes, sir. Do you believe that there is a, a rise in, since the 80s in uh, immunodeficiency syndrome, whether or not all be labeled under the blanket of AIDS or whether or not HIV necessarily be the cause of it, but that certainly there is something that is attacking the immune system and killing people, or do you believe that it's no more than is ordinary or that has always been happening? Now, I, I, for one thing, I've never been able to quite figure out what an immunologist is talking about when he describes the condition of having antibodies to some foreign virus as being an immunodeficiency. I mean, do they mean that you can't make antibodies anymore? Do they mean that your immune cells are dying off? If your CD4 cells are, in fact, useful to you, maybe they're right. Nobody has really shown that CD4 cells are necessary. So I don't even know if immune deficiency is the way I would talk about the changes in the ratios of, of CD4 markers on immune cells or CD8 markers. That's what they usually measure. Nobody had ever measured that before the 1980s, and nobody's ever shown that that alone really has any kind of clinical significance. It may be that they just go up and down like the tides, and it's really not something to be at all upset about. As soon as somebody puts a lemon on and says, if you've got less than 200 CD4 cells, you're sick, and then they start giving you drugs that kill your CD4 cells, that could have the effect of making it look like it was a bad thing in the first place. But I, as far as what, what are all those little funny diseases, like uh, cryptococcus and, uh, and Car pneumocystis carinia and Kaposi's sarcoma and those kind of things that we've lumped under this term AIDS, and also uterine cancer that's been stuck under there, Except for uterine cancer, which I think was kind of like a very uh, transparent, like uh, the motive there was transparent. I mean, we, want, we need some more women with AIDS, right? So that was a good way to get some women. And, but except for that one, I say all those other things, really, the way they came about in the 80s and the late 70s were as a result of a fairly experimental lifestyle, okay? What particular aspects of that lifestyle caused them? I don't know. It's hard to figure it out. For any one of them, if you were to really pursue it and say, I'm going to figure it out, why that one? Why pneumocystis carinia ever happened? If you could disentangle it from all the rest of them and get some research funding to try to find out why certain people die these days of pneumocystis carinia, you probably could. It's probably just another goddamn disease. It was a result, probably, of a type of a life that had not been lived too much in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and probably not much ever before. Whether it was the drug use, the lack of sleep, the t poor nutrition, the tremendous number of contacts with other humans, and, and sexual contacts is a, simply the least of those, by the way. The gregarious contacts of any kind with human beings will get you the flu. Okay, most viruses do not respect the gender or the genital organs of us because they're such small things and so very seldom used. They go for our lungs. 
Okay, I mean, that's one of the first things they made the mistake. I said, why do they think it's just a venereal? Because we don't know any viruses that are. And viruses, you know, they don't live here because they're fat and rich. They live here because they're lean and clever. And if you go for the genitals, when you could be going for the lungs, you're a pretty dumb virus. <laughs> right? I mean, because we blow air out. You get in an elevator with something. You know what? The CDC wouldn't want to be saying that, but uh, they don't have any evidence at all. Now they've said deep kissing. Mm. <laughs> on the basis of one, one person. But the, the, the disease is real, AIDS, but it's not a disease. The fact is real that when you start having a life that, that pays very little attention to the stuff your mother and your grandmother would have said, you gotta have this, you gotta have that, you can goddamn go out and be a Democrat if you want to, but you gotta eat and you gotta sleep. And, and they would have said, I mean, you stop doing those things, which a lot of people did. In, in a really large, a big way. And, I mean, the people that live next door to me in Berkeley started looking real sick a few years after they started coming over to San Francisco at night to the bathhouses. And I don't think it had to do with the disease they got. I think it was because they didn't eat or sleep. And drugs figures into it because the only way to live without eating or sleeping is to take amphetamines to stay at work and to take downers and stuff to go to sleep between four and six. You know, and then you don't have much of an appetite, and you get skinny, and you get pale, and it's fashionable, and so it's okay. But that will lead to diseases, eventually, probably, unless we're real lucky. Also, we, in, in our history, we've never had the sexual and the psychedelic revolution the way we had it in the 60s. At the hopefully end of the neither one were harmful. I would rather let that alone. You know, we don't have anything saying either one of those things were bad for us. They were emotionally involving, and we see things like that big close-up and important. Okay? I think nutrition and sleep are the first ones. Psychedelics and television and whatever, and sex if you want to get into that. But you know, sex has been around a long time. Didn't seem to hurt us. It's back necessary. But the combination be bad if it turned out to be lethal, wouldn't it? Isai, yeah. the, the question about increased immune suppression. Certainly, there's been an increase in HIV testing since the early '80s. Right now, a third of the people who develop AIDS in the United States didn't have any immune suppression or any other AIDS symptoms until they started taking AZT. So certainly, that's one factor that effect. didn't exist prior to the, to the 1980s, the consumption of, of AZT, which I'm convinced is a cause of AIDS and maybe the primary cause of AIDS today. Um, I just wanted to say too that something that was really revealing to me, I was at a, a PLUS seminar where I'm no longer welcome, uh, sponsored by LA Shanti Foundation. <laughs> And we, I was there learning about what it meant to be HIV positive, how long I could expect to live. And at that time, they granted me five years. And this was based on a slide that we were being shown. And the slide information was gathered from something noted in an asterisk, which was the San Francisco Gay Men's Study. I, I had looked at that before I was at that seminar that day and had noted that the people who originally studied in, in creating this HIV AIDS hypothesis were this group of people that had also been involved with um, experimental vaccines for hepatitis and had had many and concurrent venereal disease infections, had had parasitic infections, bacterial infections, amoebas, parasites, hepatitis A, B, um, I don't know if they were doing C back then or not, had um, n not practiced good nutrition, had not done anything that would remotely keep them alive, and the fact that they were, were very, very ill, completely depleted, and, and on their last legs of living before anybody ever bothered to give them a diagnosis of AIDS was never mentioned until I raised my hand and said, for those of us who haven't lived like that, who haven't spent 10, 12 years on antibiotics and, and done crystal meth a whole lot and gotten everything with an idiot or anemia on the end, what does this information have to do with us? And the doctor looked at the floor for a few seconds and said, absolutely nothing, because these are a very particular group of people that were studied to come to this HIV AIDS hypothesis. And the mistake was very great in trying to say that everyone would be sick like they did because they did a lot of things to make themselves sick. Yeah. Also, another thing is what we see on television and newspaper reports as the spread of AIDS is not one criteria. In other words, before 1987, they had a different um, definition. So that in 1986, you had more deaths of AIDS than in 1987. It started peaking already. I think people realized the lifestyle. They, you know, they closed the, ba the bathhouses. 
And a lot of people started taking much better care of themselves. So in order to allay the fears that this thing would be going down or to change the impression that this was being conquered already, they changed the definition, added a whole new set of diseases, brought, down the, the, or brought up the number of T cells, and all of a sudden, overnight, it doubled the amount of people that were now considered AIDS. Now, if we keep redefining this thing, including more and more diseases, in other words, growing the net larger and larger, we're not finding something that's truly growing. We're growing the criteria with which we measure. So that's not, it's deceptive. Let's, uh, another question or comments? You guys were saying something over there. <laughs> it looked pretty provocative. Isa, there was a lady over here. So what you're saying is, is that, that immunodeficiency in human beings, of course, exists. I mean, it could happen to anybody, not necessarily because of their sexual partners or drug transfusion. But then isn't there, in effect, no cure for AIDS? If it is something like because of your lifestyle or the chemicals in the water or this or that, that has beaten down an individual's immune system, and I'm not grouping anybody, not a, a homosexual, not a, a drug user, just an individual that has had their immune system so weakened because of their lifestyle, then there would not necessarily be a cure or even there, a place there, to look there, for but a But there is, but there is. It's in looking at the individual. Because what is called AIDS in, in one person is called, and is called AIDS in another person is a completely different thing. If you're a woman, you test HIV positive and you have a yeast infection, that's called AIDS. If you're a man and you test HIV positive and you have pneumonia, that's also called AIDS. When we're not looked at as individual people, we all get the same treatment a toxic chemotherapy called AZT. When you're looked at in an individual, you get treatment for your pneumonia. Now, a regular normal person who's tested HIV negative receives pneumonia treatment, and, and they're told to go home, take a rest, take, take some time off work. They're not told to fill out your will, get ready to die, sign up with an AIDS organization, and it's all over with, nobody's going to want to touch you again, check out. That's where the problem is, is we treat everybody the same. There's 30 different illnesses and conditions that are listed under the category of AIDS. AIDS is not a disease, as many people think. It's a category, just like I was doing an analogy with someone the other day, housewares. You can't hold a houseware. You can have a blender or a dish, but there's no such thing as a houseware. There's no such thing as AIDS. There's only the blenders and the dishes and the, the pneumonias and the tuberculosis and all that stuff that goes in there. If you treat the person who is sick and leave alone those who have simply tested positive and well, there is no let's hope for a cure, let's wait for a cure, let's pray for a cure. The cure is here. And it, you can restore an immune system that has not been taken so far astray by the destruction of the bone marrow and, and the spleen and the liver and all that other stuff that AZT and all these wonderful drugs that AIDS organizations bring us and push on us. You can get better. There are many people who have and many people who stay well once they stop doing that. And you also need to, in a certain sense, get rid of what's in here, which causes a tremendous spiritual death. You tell somebody they're going to die, the lights go out. There's no hope for tomorrow. And every morning when you get up, I went through this. You know, my hair is falling. Oh, my God, it's a, it's a cancer pimple. It's not a pimple. You know, you, you expect the worst of everything. And in this paradigm of AIDS, there is no way out. Everything is, is called a result of HIV. And I'm not joking. I read an article once that said a buildup of earwax is symptomatic of HIV. There's a young woman who called us the pregnancy stories again. I'm collecting them. This woman who called us who's pregnant, and she just had her baby. We got her off AZT, luckily, and the kid was actually born and born without the typical hole in its chest or six fingers or had to be therapeutically aborted or aborted itself. The child was born, and we hope it's going to be all right. In her subsequent visits to the doctor, she was told that the moles that she had developed during her pregnancy were symptomatic of HIV. I'm in a prenatal, prenatal class out in Simi Valley. Half the women in there are whining about moles during pregnancy because it's something that happens. Their names are Tammy and they've never tested positive. So nobody puts this crap on them. But it's a very hard thing to live with. To, to be told that you're supposed to die and to have everything that you turn on television and every magazine that you open tell you that too. So you've got to recover in two ways. One, find a doctor that's going to treat you like a human being and two, get enough information to believe that you have the right to be here and get well because you can. Good. Yeah, 
yeah. same disease yeah. as anybody else. Yes, yeah, somebody who's HIV positive can get over their yeast infection just like anybody else can. Somebody who's got pneumonia and has tested HIV positive can get over their pneumonia just like anybody else can. The trick is don't get into the system that pushes chemotherapy on you. A cancer patient does not get chemotherapy every day for the rest of their life. Nobody here is going to get cancer chemotherapy as a prevention of cancer that may occur 10 years down the line. That's what's screwing people up. That, that's what's making the difference between getting better and, and getting dead. I would also like to add, if I could real quickly, that there's a, and it may be semantics for a lot of people in here, but at least for me, it's extremely important. I think that it's very necessary to be cautious with the kind of words that we use. This cure word is a, is a, a silly notion that feeds us all into a path along what Carrie was referring to um, earlier when he was discussing, you know, the why, why are you listening to the white coat and you're looking to him to do something. All that we need to be concerned with here is healing. And no more do we talk about healing. We talk about the cure. Be here for the cure. Well, there isn't going to be a cure. There's, there's healing and that's all there is. And I think that we need to be very, very careful with how we've... I spent many, many years of my life trying to find something that was killing me. There wasn't anything there. No cure and in that process, there was no healing occurring. Um, I was going to ask you about um, the virus that has been passed on to the children of, of, of pregnant mothers, of babies born to. Um, are, are you saying that the treatment that they have received is what has um, created AIDS? In the, in the, the, the babies that are born to women who test positive oftentimes will test positive when they're born. And that's because babies are born without an immune system. That's why the World Health Organization tells us that if women around the world would just breastfeed, we'd, we'd decrease the rates of infant mortality tremendously because they would avail themselves to the mother's natural protective system, which is becomes the baby's own for a while through antibodies. So these babies get antibodies to everything when they're breastfed and, and sometimes just through you know being born and all that kind of stuff when the kids test positive for antibodies many times they're put on AZT and other drugs that yes turn them into AIDS victims and kill them and deplete them if left alone 70 to 90 percent of these kids will test HIV antibody negative within the first 18 months of life as they develop their own immune system Plus, even if they don't test HIV negative after 18 months, it's not said that that won't happen further along the way. Many children have. There's a couple who adopted a Romanian orphan and it took her a while to start testing negative. She's fine, but she was put on AZT for a while and it caused tremendous pain. She stopped growing. She got sick. Her hair was falling out. The usual chemotherapy She stuff. had AIDS. She had AIDS by, by virtue of the prescription of AZT. But, but it's a terrible thing when we live in a country that says, if you're pregnant, don't have a beer. Don't, don't take aspirin. You know, don't take anything and stay away from secondhand smoke, but load up on chemotherapy because somehow that'll do you some good. And it is completely wrong. And the focus of many, many AIDS organizations is pediatric AIDS because it's kind of a safe, warm, happy little place. It's all about babies and stuff. Well, these people are slaughtering babies is what it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, it's really sad and awful, but that's what they're doing. They're telling mothers that they have to take these drugs, and these drugs are lethal. If it's not Thursday, it'll be two years from now, but, but the kids will suffer from this. Based on, by the way, fraudulent studies by the makers. Again, we have... Glaxo, welcome, Burroughs, welcome, testing AZT to check maternal transmission rates. Well, previously, they were like 25 or 30 percent naturally. Then they said, well, AZT brought them down to 8.6 or 8.3 percent. And this is why my friend, the doctor, was faxing me this stuff, because I, I asked medical doctors, please, anything HIV, just show me what they show you. Well, we've got to put pregnant mothers, all HIV-positive mothers. When when many of them don't even pass it on. Now, what they don't tell you, which I think is unconscionable, is that vitamin A cuts it down to 7.6. Vitamin A does a better job at halting maternal transmission rates than vitamin AZT. But they can't control the patent. So guess what? You have to take the, the, the filth that they can make money off of. And I think, why aren't our politicians and media people talking about this? 
this is why most of them don't know. Most of them don't feel comfortable um, receiving unofficial information. Not that you would ever, should be concerned if your baby's HIV positive or try to cut down on the rate since it's, there's no reason to think that having HIV is a bad thing. Was your question why are babies getting AIDS? Was that the question? Sort of, was that what you're curious about? If, if it was the AZT that was giving babies AIDS in many well, ways. Well, there's other, I mean, do you, do you remember crack babies? Yeah. Okay, crack babies were before a HIV came along. Then after HIV came along, they okay. started calling them AIDS babies. So, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of people that have severe health problems, a lot of drug users, no matter what is causing their health problems, Gary. And I'm not suggesting that you do consume recreational drugs, by the way. What were those leaves you were um, eating, by the way? Hmm? What's that? What were those leaves you were eating? They're right up oh. here. They're right up there. They probably have pesticides all over them. They probably but, um, wiped them. The, I was just um, making a point. With these, uh, the people that are, that are in these groups tend to be positive for just about every germ that you could possibly imagine. And if you look at the early AIDS studies, the, 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 the AIDS babies were born to mothers, for example, that were positive for... Hepatitis A, Hepatitis B, Cytomegavirus, Herpes 1, Herpes 2, Herpes 3, Herpes 4, everything. And then they come up with the new germ, HIV, and they're, yeah, they're positive for that as well. So yeah, there's a lot of HIV positive babies who are sick before AZ, H, AZT comes along. But look at their mothers. They were drug addicts for their first you know, nine months after uh, conception. So that shouldn't be, surprise us that babies born to mothers who take drugs are, are sick. There's a whole other insidious aspect to this, and we'll, we'll wrap this up as soon as I can, but let's just take Paul and myself. We go in, we get an AIDS test. They're looking for the antibodies. Well, what they're actually looking for are reactions to the proteins of the antibodies. So if you have been exposed to those proteins, your blood will, will say, wow, I've been exposed to P41, P26, P124, and those are the proteins that make up HIV. What they don't tell you is that those proteins don't only go to make up HIV. They go to make up other antibodies. So if you have enough other things in you, you could add up to a total that looks like HIV, either fully or indeterminate. Now, here goes back to the test. Paul and I, we go into um, uh, uh, the AIDS doctor. He takes a test. We come back with the exact same results. Each of the proteins like half of them that go to make up HIV are positive, and we have the exact same results. It's called indeterminate. They're not enough, not, not few enough, not too much. At this point, the doctor refers to the medical literature, which says, because, the, because of the test sensitivity, we have to ask you questions to make sure this isn't a false positive. Mr. Philpot, are you gay? Uh, a not, truthful answer? <laughs> yeah. No. Mr. Philpot, have you had lots of sexual partners? Just say no. Uh, hell yeah. No, no, no. Oh, just no? say no, no. No. Mr. No. Philpot, are you married? Yeah. Mr. Philpot, do you take drugs? All the time? No. No, no, no I don't take drugs. Okay, now, the, he goes into Mr. Philpot was a false positive. Now, they'll ask me, let's just say hypothetically, Esai or, or Can dude. I ask the questions? Yes. <laughs> are you gay? Well, um, for, yes, the, okay. for the sake of this argument, well, <laughs> only on weekends. Okay, that's gay enough. Um, are you married? Uh, well, no. Have you been doing drugs? Well, Injected drugs. I, well, I used to shoot up. Uh, well, I used to take poppers, but I... So I, you're probably HIV positive then. There you go. The same exact results. If you're black, that adds up to it. You know, it pushes you. It, this is ridiculous. But this is what you and I have allowed to go on by not testing this any further. Is there anything else? Do you guys... Is, is there any question in your minds about um, what we're saying about... Um, because there's a lot we haven't covered. To Can end I ask this, a question? Yes, yes sir. Mm -hmm. I want to ask this to Carrie. How do they um, misuse PCR to estimate uh, all these so supposed free viral RNAs that may or may not be there? Uh, is this, um, I think misuse PCR is not quite... I don't think you can misuse PCR. No, the results, the interpretation of it, See, if you, if you, if you can say, if, if, if they wanted, if, if they could find this virus in you at all, and with PCR, if you do it well, you can find almost anything in anybody. It starts making you believe in the sort of Buddhist notion that everything is contained in everything else, right? I mean, because if you can amplify one single molecule up to, a, to something that you can really measure, which PCR can do, 
then there's just very few molecules that you don't have at least one single one of them in your body, okay? So that could be thought of as a misuse of it just to, to claim that it's meaningful. But the, the real misuse of it is, is that it, you don't need to test for HIV. You don't need to test for the other 10,000 retroviruses that are unnamed also in the subject. See, somebody that's got HIV generally is going to have almost anything that you can test for because they have definitely been, HIV is a fairly rare virus. There's only one million of us out of 250, 300 million people in America that have that virus. So you have to get around, either your mother had to have it and pass it to you, or you have to really be paying a lot of attention to people that do have it and paying only attention to them and get a pretty good chance of getting it that way. It's hard to get it. But it, if you have it, there's a good chance you've also got a lot of other ones. Because you've been in the, in the market for you've been it's been possible for you to get a lot of it's, it's, it's a, to test for that one and say that has any special meaning is what I think is the problem. Not that PCR has been misused. It's like they, it's, an estimation? it's not an estimation. It's a real. It's a really quantitative thing. It How tells you it? something about nature and about what's there. But it 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 allows you to take a very minuscule amount of anything and make it measurable and then talk about it in meetings and stuff like it is important. See that that that's not a misuse. That's just sort of a misinterpretation. After all the these uh, uh, PCR, this quantitative PCR, that if you just get down to a basic virological count, it's still one in a thousand to one in ten thousand uh, uh, HIV in one to one in a thousand, one in five hundred to one in a thousand T cells. It, and it is. No, they, that, th th there's very little of what they call HIV, and what's been brought out here by Phil Pot and, and, and Isai already, it, the measurement for it. Is not is not exact at all. It's not it's not as good as our measurement for things like apples. An apple is an apple. You know, you can get something that's kind of like if you got enough things that look kind of like an apple and you stick them all together, you might think it as an apple. But and, and HIV is like that. Those tests are all based on things that are invisible, and they are the results are inferred in a sense. PCR is separate from that. It's just a process that's used to make a whole lot of something out of something. That's what also, it is. But, um, it's, but it's not. It doesn't tell you that you're sick, and it doesn't tell you that the thing you ended up with really was going to hurt you or anything like that. That's why it's not. So even if you believe in HIV, it can't tell the difference between virus particles or active live virus. I mean, there's a lot of questions involved. Mm -hmm. Guys, thank you very, very much. I don't know what else I can say but to uh, let you know that we will um, hold more events where people can get together. Hopefully not when they're all out of town for the holidays. But uh, when we can have a really, really continuing and a growing movement of people asking simple questions. We don't expect to convert anyone. We just expect to plant the seeds of doubt and concern because this affects us all, gay, straight or not. It affects us all. I'm tired of being terrorized. I'm tired of sex equaling death when in fact it equals the opposite. I'm just tired of being, having my tax dollars taken to terrorize me and, and, and the rest of our citizenry. Guys, I think uh, I owe a thanks to our panel. And, and also, Laura's going to make an announcement about valet. Just the valet parking, um, they want to differentiate between us and everyone else. So everyone write HM on the back of your valet parking ticket, and then they will not charge you. Okay? It's very important if you, if you don't want to pay. A meeting of heel that is on a small pink flyer on the table there. We have free meetings every month, and you can come and find out more about this stuff every month for free. It's a, a Wednesday towards the end of every month in West Hollywood.